Hi, everyone. Well, it is 6 p.m., so I would like to take a moment to welcome everyone to welcome everyone to WSDA's 2021 Virtual Gypsy Moth Open House. My name is Carla Salp, and I'm the Public Engagement Specialist with the Washington State Department of Agriculture. And I'm just going to ask your indulgence a little bit. We have had, we actually did a practice just a few days ago, and the system completely changed um, between when we did our practice and when we uh, end today. So um, we may have some technical issues, but we ask your patience and we'll work through those. Um, many people, of course, have become familiar with WSDA's pest program thanks to our work uh, to detect and eradicate Asian giant hornet, but we have a long history of working to protect Washington's environment from invasive species. Our gypsy moth program is one of the longest running of those programs. While we normally provide an in-person open house in areas where we propose to treat for gypsy moths, this year we are only offering this online virtual open house due to COVID-19 concerns. Although we are not able to gather in person today, you will still receive the same information this evening that you would normally receive by attending our in-person open house. We'll have a variety of speakers that will provide an overview about gypsy moth, our trapping program, our current proposed eradication plan, and the proposed biological insecticide, and why eradication is important. We normally also show a video about gypsy moth in our program that has uh, kept gypsy moths from establishing in Washington for over 40 years, if you can believe that. So it's, a, it's an excellent success story. Uh, while we won't play that video tonight, it's always available on our website at agr.wa.gov slash gypsy moth, and it's on YouTube. So you can just do a little search for a video called Saving Our Trees, Protecting Washington from Gypsy Moth, and you can watch it at your convenience. I'll also post a link to that in the, in the comments, uh, excuse me, in the chat box shortly. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. We will answer questions, but it will be at the end of the presentation. So to ask a question, please submit your questions using the chat box. If you're unable to use the chat function or do we, we do not get to your question this evening or you think of something later, you can always contact us directly at gypsymoth at agr.wa.gov or by calling our hotline at 1-800-443-6684. And all that contact information you'll see on many of the slides throughout the presentation this evening. Also, just a reminder that this is an informational session. If you'd like to make a public comment for the record, there will be an opportunity to do that once our environmental assessments are complete, and those will be made available for public review and comment. And that should happen next month. So you can sign up for, on our listserv to be alerted when those documents are available for review and public comment. All right, with that, we are about ready to start. Susan Brush with the WSDA Pest Program will now kick off the virtual open house. Susan, take it away. Hello, thank you, Carla. And thank you to everyone for taking time from your evening to attend our virtual open house. My name is Susan Brush. I'm a pest biologist for WSDA's Pest Program. I work on gypsy moth survey and trapping here in Washington State. Tonight, I'll be providing a background on gypsy moth in the United States, Asian gypsy moth, and the 2020 survey results from our trapping program. Next slide, please, Leah. Gypsy moth is a non-native pest introduced to the United States in 1869 in Medford, Massachusetts. Specimens were brought over from Europe to be crossbred with silk moths to start an exciting new industry in America but the idea never really worked and a population of European gypsy moth left unchecked soon established. Next slide, please. There has been an ongoing effort to slow the spread of gypsy moth in the Eastern United States for over 20 years. Eradication efforts giving way to suppression efforts. In 2019, across the leading margin of the slow the spread program, there were close to 300,000 acres treated for gypsy moth. Our management practices in Washington are centered on prevention, and we survey for gypsy moth every year to detect any introductions. 
allowing us to rapidly respond and implement an eradication project. This quick response allows us to minimize the number of acres that needs to be treated and ensure that gypsy moths do not become established in our state. Next slide. Living with gypsy moth looks a lot like winter, but in the summer. Gypsy moth caterpillars feed voraciously on leaf foliage, growing in size from the tiniest of instar larvae to robust fat caterpillars. They have distinctive markings and the hairs on their body meant to deter predators can cause allergic reactions. The caterpillars are active in spring, usually in May and June, but sometimes as early as April. Next slide. Gypsy moths can consume large swaths of forest and frequently do in established parts of the eastern United States, where you can see defoliation from space. This image taken of Rhode Island during the summer of 2016 shows the magnitude of defoliation a gypsy moth infestation can cause in a single month. Next slide. Gypsy moths are a large moth. The males are tawny brown with zigzag markings and bold feathery antenna. The females are white, considerably larger, and have high contrast black markings. Both have the distinctive dot comma markings on their forewing that distinguish them as gypsy moth. Asian and European gypsy moth can only be distinguished from each other by genetic markers. So all of our specimens are identified by WSDA's Molecular Diagnostics Lab and then confirmed by the USDA Otis Laboratory. The adult moth is active in the summer months. In Washington, we see most of the moth activity in August, but some years as early as June and as late as October. Next slide, please. We have several native species of moths that are frequently mistaken for gypsy moth. While the Western tent caterpillar and fall webworm are nuisance pests to homeowners, they are not regulated pests and they do not pose as serious a threat as gypsy moth. They lack the distinctive red and blue dots that gypsy moth has. If you see caterpillars in a web or tent in your trees, this is not gypsy moth. Gypsy moth do not make webs. If you need assistance controlling one of these pests, reach out to your local WSU Extension Office or Master Gardener Program. Next slide. European gypsy moth is most commonly brought over by people moving from infested areas in the eastern United States to Washington. Egg masses are transported on outdoor household articles like patio furniture, barbecues, or recreational vehicles. The dense, fuzzy egg masses are laid under protective surfaces and subsequently transported here, where they hatch, consume foliage, pupate, and emerge as adult moths. Next slide. We survey each summer for gypsy moth that may have unknowingly been introduced into Washington State. We use triangle-shaped insect traps. They come in green, brown, and orange. And the color doesn't necessarily indicate a specific survey or pest. You may have seen these around a park or in your neighborhood. They go up in early summer and come down in early fall. There are no insecticides in these traps, but please do not disturb them. They have a string pheromone lure that attracts male moths to the trap, where they become stuck in a very sticky adhesive called tanglefoot which is difficult to remove and will stain your clothing. Traps are installed at a baseline density of one trap per square mile across Western Washington and in suitable habitat in Eastern Washington. This is to survey for European gypsy moth. We also survey at a higher density in our 11 marine international ports and along the waterways where cargo ships pass, approximately nine traps per square mile. This is to detect any introductions of Asian gypsy moth. Next slide, please. Asian gypsy moth has not established in the United States. It is the same species as European gypsy moth, and we use the same trap and pheromone lure to survey for it, but its native range is different than European gypsy moth and has different behavioral and biological characteristics. Firstly, Asian gypsy moth are more robust and can fly significantly farther than their European counterparts. 
Second, female Asian gypsy moths are capable of flight, whereas European females cannot fly. This creates a greater potential for establishment. Lastly, Asian gypsy moth has shown specific preference for conifers, which are widely abundant in our state. Once deciduous trees have their leaves consumed, they will re-leaf out in the same season as a response. This stresses or weakens the tree, and over multiple years of this stress can cause the tree to die. Conifers, on the other hand, do not have this life strategy, and once needles are consumed, the tree can no longer photosynthesize and it dies. We have a lot higher stakes in our forest if this pest were to become established. Next slide. Asian gypsy moth is transported to Washington on container ships from Asia. The moths are attracted to the bright lights of ports there. They mate and lay eggs in the protective ridges of shipping containers, which are then loaded up and head off to sea. Customs and border protection perform inspections on international cargo before it comes into the United States. And vessels even undergo a pre-voyage AGM specific inspection before they leave Asia. So survey and eradication are not our only defenses in play here, but they are our last lines of prevention. Next slide. The establishment of a gypsy moth population threatens the health of our forests, but also our industries. It would trigger export restrictions and quarantines for Christmas tree, timber, nursery, and port industries. Next slide. Looking at our numbers from last year, we had 21,769 traps total placed across the state. There were nine gypsy moth detections in 2020. Eight of these detections were European gypsy moths that we will continue to monitor in 2021 to determine if any type of eradication response is necessary in the future. We did have one detection that was determined to be the Asian variety of gypsy moth. This gypsy moth was found in a trap near the Silver Lake boat landing in Cowlitz County. We are unable to, detect, to identify how it found its way there, but the close proximity to the large areas of forest land, combined with the Asian gypsy moth's ability to travel long distances and their preference for conifer species could be devastating without a quick response to eliminate the population. This detection is the focus of our eradication project. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to our eradication coordinator, Ryan Wojan. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, this is Ryan Wojan. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so I'll go over kind of uh, what we're doing with the uh, the treatment this year, uh, kind of how we do things. Um, we are going to use uh, uh, BTK is the product that we'll use. And there's a, a number of other um, treatment methods that we considered. Um, I won't go into all of that stuff um, because it's probably easier to read it. So if you go on to the USDA um, has their 2012, it was a, uh, uh, final supplemental environmental impact statement um, that they did, and it's on our website, and it just goes into in depth on all that stuff there. Um, it's on our website. Uh, the, if you go to Gypsy Moth and then go to uh, Control Efforts, you can find it in there. Um, and you can get lots of information. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Um, and the, it sounds like I'm passing it off to everybody, but uh, Paul Marchant will, um, he's from the Washington State Department of Health, but he'll, and he'll go deeper into BTK, but it's, uh, we like it. It's uh, naturally, naturally occurring uh, bacterial uh, insecticide uh, that just targets caterpillars. Uh, and it's proven safe uh, through studies, proven safe for humans uh, and animals. Um, and it doesn't, uh, doesn't affect beneficial, like you see insects, bees or birds, um, fish, plants and mammals. 
Um, it's certified organic by the uh, Organic Materials uh, Review Institute. So uh, that's OMRI. So they, they go over, um, they review the products um, every year to make sure um, that they can stay um, or used on organic crops. Um, and this one can be used uh, for this uh, purpose. Okay, go ahead. You can go to the next one. So we have, uh, we have four phases that we like to go through um, or that we go through. Uh, the phase one, we just determine uh, when egg hatch will occur. And the way we do that is uh, we run um, site specific uh, weather model, uh, weather uh, models and to see when exactly the eggs are gonna hatch out. Um, if there's, if we can find an egg mass or egg masses uh, in the treatment area that we could monitor, that would be best case scenario. So we could see when that, when they are getting ready to hatch, then we would know we're close. Um, also, uh, we monitor the foliage, um, foliage development, because we want, what we want is the BTK to land on the foliage and we want the caterpillar to eat the foliage. That's how they get the uh, uh, BTK that, event that kills them. So what we don't want to happen is the caterpillars to get too big and they eat the foliage and get BTK and they, they basically just get a bellyache uh, from uh, because they're it, too too far along in the life stage. Um, so go ahead. Oh, actually, uh, phase two. Oh, go back one. Sorry about that. Let's see. Keep going. Okay, phase two. Uh, so then we notify uh, notify residents, um, and you can go onto our website, or Carla might. I don't know if it's on Facebook and all that kind of stuff, but. Um, to be notified by text or email or robocall. And we'll let you know uh, treatment dates, uh, times, you know, things, if things change at the last second, uh, you'll be able to uh, get that information. So yeah, just go, you can go onto our website, sign up for that stuff. Um, phase three is the treatment portion of it. And It'll probably be three treatments, but we say three to five treatments. Um, they're weather dependent. Uh, it's seven to ten days apart. It's weather dependent on that, so it could be you know it could be five or six. You know I, you know it's how it spaces out. It's generally seven to ten days though, and we won't treat if it's raining. Um, but if there was dew or if it was going to rain later in the day. We wouldn't treat, um, but if there was dew, like early morning, and there's dew on the leaves, as long as the, as long as the water's not running off of the leaf, or the leaves, then we will, will treat because we just need that to, we need the product to uh, be able to dry, on, uh, the leaves, once it's dry, it's not going to come off, so we need about. The water not to be running off, you know, like I said, dew would be fine. And then if it's not going to rain for, you know, 10 hours or something like that, then we'd be good to go. So uh, we definitely follow the weather close. Um, phase four. Uh, so after we, we're done with treatments, um, it's the intensive trapping portion. And that's to confirm uh, success or failure of the uh, treatments um, and if follow-up follow treatments are needed. Um, and traps will be placed by um, Tiffany Paws. Her, her, she leads the uh, trapping program um, and her, uh, her team, 
Susan, Susan is uh, uh, part of that whole thing. Um, that'll be 2001, 2002, and 2003 trapping seasons, summer trapping seasons. There'll be pretty high density traps trapping in uh, that area. Um, so go ahead and go to the next one. I think there's one more. So this is a map of the proposed treatment area. It's 639 acres. Um, I already said like the, th the three to five applications, likely three, um, the follow-up trapping, BTK. So really went into all that stuff. Um, the thing, the thing that the, the little box there that area is not going to be treated. We we needed to keep it under 640 acres, but we wanted to get as much forest as possible. So we kind of took that little box right there, cut that little part out because there wasn't anything really there. Uh, and so we said, okay, that we'll just won't treat that uh, portion, but so we'll be able to treat some of the more of the green belts on the outside. Um, so it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty, it's suburban kind of rural, you know, farm, small farm kind of area. Lots of, uh, you know, it's around warehouser, uh, forest lands. Um, there's lots of open space. Uh, so. You know, we'll be aerial, uh, aerial treating is what we've, we've, uh, proposed aerial treatment. So there's lots of open space for that for, uh, emergencies. Uh, and so it should be, uh, it should be real quick, uh, treatment. So you can go. On to the next one. It's Paul uh, Marchant from the uh, Department of Health. Uh, he's going to go into just uh, everything to keep you healthy. Huh. All right. Hey, thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> um, yeah. So uh, my name is Paul Marchant. Um, I, I'm with a, um, I'm a pesticide illness investigator with the Washington State Department of Health. Um, I worked for over 10 years now in our pesticide program, and uh, our program uh, investigates pesticide-related illnesses uh, around the state, any part of the state. Um, it's a uh, pesticide-related illness is a um, or poisoning is a, a reportable condition in our state. So we get uh, between uh, me and the other. Uh, three investigators. We we investigate uh, anywhere from 250 to 300 uh, pesticide uh, cases every year. Uh, the vast vast majority of that is uh, chemical, the traditional sort of uh, chemical pesticides, as opposed to uh, B something like BTK here, which is not a chemical uh, insecticide. Um, we educate people about potential dangers of pesticides and how to protect yourself when applying pesticides. Uh, we use our surveillance data to help improve health and safety laws involving pesticides. And uh, I should mention that our program is uh, non-regulatory. Um, it's a public health program, but we don't, uh, we, we can't cite or fine or uh, issue notices of violation or anything like that. Um, it's, it's all about public health. So I was invited to give a brief overview on the safety of BTK for gypsy moth control in uh, residential settings, um, places of uh, where people occupy residences. And um, and uh, let's see, I think we're ready for the next slide. So what's in the spray? Um, the product, uh, like has been mentioned already, is uh, 4A48B. Um, it's an EPA registered microbial as opposed to a chemical insecticide containing BTK and other inert or non-active ingredients. Um, as far as the makeup of the, the, the product, um, it's roughly 13% BTK and, and the remainder, uh, 87 or so percent, um, are the inert inactive ingredients. 
Um, BTK is a naturally occurring soil bacterium. We're all exposed to it in our everyday environment and lives from um, incidental contact with soil, uh, foods, gardening, and that kind of thing. So um, what's in the spray? Um, there's three components that uh, we've evaluated for health concerns. Um, the first component is the BTK microbe, uh, which is a natural disease agent in caterpillars. Um, in the spray mixture, BTK exists as a spore, uh, which is the dormant form of the bacterium. Um, it becomes active and reproduces in the gut of the caterpillar. Uh, it has not been shown to cause infections in people or act as a human pathogen. Uh, pathogen meaning, uh, pathogenic meaning uh, multiplying, invading, or damaging tissue. So it has been shown not to act as a pathogen. Um, the, the second component, the toxin, um, the bacteria make, uh, makes a toxin that is specifically toxic to caterpillars. Um, it's a, the toxin is an endotoxin, a protein crystal, um, uh, which is activated in the alkaline uh, gut of the caterpillar, allowing spore germination. Um, that leads to additional destruction of the gut wall, <clears throat> allowing the bacteria to enter the circulatory system of the um, uh, caterpillar, causing infection and death, ultimately. Uh, also, shortly after consuming uh, the foliage with a BTK product on it, the cap caterpillar uh, almost immediately stops feeding, so that contributes to its demise as well. Um, and the caterpillar typically dies within a day and sometimes two or three days, depending. Um, people and other mammals <clears throat> don't have the proper pH and enzymes in our guts to activate the toxin, uh, nor do we have the specific receptor in the stomach wall for the toxin to act on. Um, and it's been found not to harm other types of non-target insects, pets, fish, birds, bees, spiders, ladybugs, ants, that kind of thing. So they're um, not impacted by it. And then the third component uh, of the product is the, uh, are the inert, the inactive inert ingredients. Um, and of that, um, most of it, uh, about 60% of it is water. Uh, the remainder are spent fermentation medium, um, like in other words, the food and nutrients used to grow the bacteria, which are primarily agricultural commodities such as grains. Uh, there's also a food approved carbohydrate in that. Uh, let's see, <clears throat> there's also pH adjusters and preservatives to keep the harmful bacteria from growing in that product. Um, and uh, let's see, it's, it's also that the product for, uh, 4A is not genetically engineered uh, and is also gluten and wheat free. Um, all the ingredients uh, in the product are approved for use on food for organic agriculture and organic gardening. And uh, let's see, so DOH um, has reviewed, I believe it was twice, not just once, the full ingredient list uh, and concluded that it was of low concern for, for human health. Um, but we cannot rule out that people allergic to certain foods, preservatives, or grains um, could possibly have a reaction um, to those uh, other ingredients. Um, in animal testing and occupational studies, it was found to be slightly irritating to the eyes and respiratory tract, and um, some mild skin um, reactions have been seen. Um, overall, BTK has a good human health safety record, including in uh, its use in residential or urban areas. And in our opinion, um, and in the opinion of EPA, Health Canada, and the World Health Organization as well, um, it's considered the least toxic uh, approach when moth control is, is needed. And the next slide, please. Um, so just wanted to mention a few studies. Um, there's been a fair number of them, um, and uh, I'm gonna mention a few of them here um, that uh, just evaluated um, um, you know, effects or potential effects of um, after spraying events. So um, once the first study I'll mention is uh, one that was done in the Victoria, British Columbia area in 1999. Um, in that study, uh, researchers uh, conducted a study of children with moderate to severe asthma. They wanted to know if you know that uh, uh, asthma would be um, triggered or exacerbated after um, treatment in that area. They did not measure, so the, one of the results is they did not measure worsening of asthma symptoms following the spray events. 
and both subjective and objective measures of lung function were collected. Um, another finding from that study was that there was no increased visits to healthcare providers for asthma, respiratory disease, and skin reactions. Uh, another finding uh, from that was uh, no, in, uh, no increase in symptoms for those folks that lived in the sprayed areas compared to um, the, uh, the children that, that uh, lived in the non-sprayed areas. And no infections were found in the general population due to BTK. So those were the, the major findings from that study. Um, there was also a study done in uh, New Zealand uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, main finding there was there was no increase in medical visits for a number of different uh, conditions and diseases. Um, there was follow-up on self-reported symptoms among residents, uh, but uh, the researchers were unable to tie them specifically to the spray or to rule them out. So uh, it's kind of difficult uh, in this situation because um, there's they're typically uh, the spraying event uh, kind of coincides with the spring um, allergy season. So um, there's other you know factors that could have contributed to uh, the symptoms that were reported. It's just really difficult, if not impossible, to tease those those out. Um, and in Washington, in our own state, um, after spraying uh, aerial spraying in 1992 and 2000, um, there were some um, uh, studies of uh, reports of um, symptoms came in from that. And uh, they were like, I've already mentioned uh, uh, in, in a little while ago, uh, they were typical symptoms that we would expect like um, eye and nose and throat irritation, um, some mild skin reactions and some hay fever type symptoms. But we were again, unable to determine whether these were related to the spray or if they were the result of spring allergy season or even possibly dust and pollen that might have been uh, disturbed or kicked up by the, um, the plane or the helicopters applying the product. And in animal testing, uh, neither BTK or the formulated product was found to be toxic to mammals, uh, except at extremely high administered doses, both oral and intravenous doses, uh, much, much higher doses than, than you know, uh, individuals on the ground after spraying events like, uh, you know, as planned uh, would be exposed to. So. Uh, just wanted to make make you aware of, of, of the animal studies involved much much higher doses. Um, rodents fed the substance for two years. Essentially, their lifespan uh, were found not to have developed cancer. That was one of the endpoints that they were looking for in, in terms of more uh, chronic type health effects. Um, and uh, ready for the next slide, please. Um, so. Because I mentioned we're, uh, the pesticide program is a surveillance program, we um, track uh, pesticide related illnesses that are reported to us and do a whole, uh, you know, we have a whole process for evaluating those to see if they are in fact, uh, the symptoms reported were uh, um, in fact uh, related to the pesticide exposure or not. So uh, anyway, I wanted to have a slide here that just showed some of the uh, uh, reports of um, gypsy moth spray cases that were reported to us since 2016. So um, um, in 20, uh, as the slide shows in 2016, we did get 10 reports of um, symptoms of illness. Um, we found that only one of those uh, was possibly related to the spring in that case. And that, uh, that particular, um, case uh, was we, we classified as low severity. It was an employee at a company um, uh, where he was outside at work essentially when the plane came by and um, uh, he, he wasn't aware that his work site was included in the spray zone um, and within minutes of the application reported some uh, mild res uh, respiratory symptoms. Um, he did have, in this case, pre-existing medical conditions um, and reported that he was also uh, sensitive to chemicals. So, um, uh, I, uh, as I recall, the, the next day he was, he was fine. So, it was kind of a, a short-term mild respiratory reaction. Um, so, I, the, oh, and the other, that was 2016. So, 2017, there was no eradication that year. 2018 and 19, uh, we got a total of four cases reported to from each of the years. Uh, none of those cases or uh, reports that we uh, we determined were uh, re related to the spring. And then last year, we got no reports, just a few inquiries, uh, people asking some questions. So 
anyway, we're, we're around for that um, this year. Um, any Anyone that um, feels that they were exposed and, and developed uh, you know, symptoms, then we're still uh, the go-to agency to uh, you know let us know and we'll follow up as we do all our uh, pesticide related cases. And uh, next slide, please. So last slide, just um, our public health advice and recommendations. The bottom line is we don't expect infection or illness to result in the general population following spraying with BTK. Um, because we can't rule out that there could be symptoms related to allergy or mild irritation, uh, we still encourage people to minimize their exposure to the spray droplets. Um, as a precaution, uh, we're asking, or we're suggesting or recommending that people uh, stay inside during the spraying and uh, 30 minutes um, after the spraying to allow the majority of the droplets to settle. Um, there's been studies that show that the majority of droplets would be expected to settle within the first five minutes and, you know, uh, between five and 15 minutes. So obviously 30 is, is quite a bit more than that, just to, just to play it safe. Um, there's conditions that could occur that one reason or another that uh, might um, cause the, uh, some of the, the lighter um, spray droplets to, to take longer to settle out. So the second recommendation um, is uh, if you've got a you know, grass area, lawn, um, or even uh, just foliage on your property, um, and you have, happen to have kids, uh, we're asking um, you know, uh, determine when the spray is dry, uh, or allow the spray to dry on the grass or the foliage before children um, could possibly have contact with it. And that's gonna depend on weather conditions. Um, it's sort of a judgment call as to whether you think that uh, it's gonna be dry. Um, if it, you know, really depending on weather, humidity, and temperature and that kind of thing, but usually within a few hours. Um, third recommendation, uh, if direct contact with the skin occurs, uh, if you're outside, uh, you happen to get a little bit on your skin, um, it's simply washing with soap and water, and that'll, that'll remove it. And lastly, if, if any should get in your eyes, uh, again, it's a water um, uh, rinse for you know, up to 15 minutes if eye contact occurs. And lastly, uh, just just to point out that you know there's people with um, with health certain health conditions. Um, let's say they could be immune compromised uh, or have severe food and food preser uh, preservative allergies. For those people, um, you know, pay extra, uh, take extra precaution, and you know, heed heed the recommendations that I just uh, laid out uh, by avoiding contact with the spray. So that is it for my uh, the formal part of the presentation. Great, Leah, could you move to the next slide, please? Next, we have a couple more um, people that are gonna share with us. First, we'll have Justin Bush from the Washington Invasive Species Council. Great, well, uh, good evening. Uh, as Carla mentioned, my name is Justin Bush. I am the executive coordinator of the State of Washington Invasive Species Council. Is brief background, the council was established by the state legislature in 2006, and it is tasked with providing policy level direction planning and coordination for combating harmful invasive species throughout the state and preventing the introduction of others that may be harmful. The council includes 22 organizations, including local, state, and federal agencies, tribal nations, academia, nonprofits, and industry. The council looks across agency missions and jurisdictions at all types of invasive species problems to find collaborative solutions. From apple maggot to gypsy moth to zebra mussels, there are many invasive species found in Washington or could be introduced at some point. There are more than 150 invasive plants known to be in Washington today, for example. To help determine the worst of the worst, the council developed an analytical tool that looked at potential impact as well as our ability to stop or take action against the problem using both peer reviewed research and professional best opinion. And one of the worst of the worst invasive species was determined to be the gypsy moths. They pose a grave threat to both private and public lands, to urban and rural forests, timber production and environmental health. There's also an indirect risk to water quality as well as salmon recovery as defoliated trees and riparian areas would cause the rivers to receive more sunlight, raising temperatures of the water 
and potentially affecting in those important salmon bearing streams. And for many years, as was mentioned, the Washington State Department of Agriculture, with the support of the US Department of Agri Agriculture and others, have successfully prevented gypsy moth from becoming established in the state. The Washington Invasive Species Council commends their work and is fully supportive of this proposed eradication project. And, and with that, I thank you for your time tonight. Thanks, Justin. Next, we'll hear from Clinton Campbell from, and I apologize, that should say USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal Plant and Plant Health Inspection Service. Uh, Leah, if you can advance the slide, please. Yes, good evening. Uh, this is Clinton Campbell with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And as you've heard, the uh, European gypsy moth certainly is a significant non-native forest pest in the United States. Um, programmatically, gypsy moth has been a federal program starting, of course, back in the east since about 1912, from what I've been told. And, of course, the idea there is to keep it in the east uh, as much as possible. The uh, Gypsy Moth program is, again, a longstanding program, a partnership between uh, federal and state partners to prevent the establishment of Gypsy Moth in areas of the United States, like here in the state of Washington, that are not uh, contiguous to the current regulated states and counties. In other words, we're far away from the generally infested area back east, and we're hoping to maintain that status. Next slide, please. And of course, you've also heard uh, ample mention about the Asian gypsy moth, given that an Asian gypsy moth is what was trapped at Silver Lake. And Asian gypsy moths, even though they're the same as European gypsy moths, uh, pose a lot more concern at, for the reasons that you've heard. And there are a number of different forms, actually, of Asian gypsy moths. Uh, think of them as subspecies. And in this slide, you see a number of names listed that represent subspecies and a lot of this is based really on the geography of where these moths come from but again uh, these are all exotic pests and they're not known to occur in the united states at all whereas european gypsy moth is found back east and so an introduction into the united states of asian gypsy moth certainly poses a major threat to the landscape and resources of the entire north american continent and the Asian gypsy moth catch at Silver Lake is a new introduction that requires the same effective federal, state, and public partnership to prevent its establishment. And with that, I will return to the monitor or moderator. Thanks so much, Clinton. Can you advance the slide, please, Leah? Um, Cassie is going to go over here in just one second. Um, how, basically how to stay informed and learn more. And I want to take this opportunity as well to ask people if you have questions that have not been answered, now's a good time to pop those in the chat box and then we will answer those when Cassie is um, done with her section. Go ahead, Cassie. All right, well, I'm going to go through on my next couple slides, show you how to sign up for email alerts or text alerts that can inform you when a spray is happening in your area. Um, but before I do that too, we do have an eradication Facebook group. Um, so you're gonna get on Facebook and go to the 2021 eradication Facebook group um, on the website, which you can see the link at the bottom, agr.wa.gov slash gypsy moth. Um, we also have blogs on that as well. And then follow the WSDA on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So let's go over how to sign up for those alerts. Next. The first thing you want to do is get on Google and type in agr.wa.gov slash gypsy moth, and it'll take you to the gypsy moth home screen. Next slide. When you're on the home screen, you're going to scroll down till you see the first blue box, and it'll be titled 2021 Asian Gypsy Moth Eradication Proposed. Um, there's some black text, and at the bottom of that text, it says learn, learn more on the 2021 eradication page. Um, that 2020 eradication page is a hyperlink, so you want to click on that. Click on that blue link. Next. When you click on that blue link, it's going to take you to this um, page that'll say stay informed. Um, and it says for updates regarding the proposed gypsy moth treatment in your area, please join our gypsy moth listserv. Go ahead and click next, Leah. 
So it's that first hyperlink that says Gypsy Moth was served. You're going to want to click on that and it'll take you to this next screen. Um, you're going to want to type in your name and your email address. Then you'll leave the subscription type. Just leave that as the regular box. And then on the topics, you're going to want to make sure that you have the Gypsy Moth topic selected. And then you're going to hit subscribe. Go ahead and click next, Leah. Um, once you hit subscribe, it will go ahead and send a confirmation to your email. Um, you'll just have to click that email to confirm, and then you'll begin to receive email updates regarding the Gypsy Moth program. Go ahead and next slide. The next way you can get um, informed to sign up for text notifications or call notifications is basically through the same thing. You want to get your phone open, open up a text message, type text 1-800-443-6684, and type in the word join text. Um, if you do this if, and you're in the air and we do a gypsy moth spray, you'll receive a text alerting you um, when the spray is going to happen. Um, you can also sign up to see, receive voicemails to your phone. <laughs> voicemails to your phone um, regarding the Gypsy Moth spray as well. It'll be the same number, and then you're just going to type join call. Um, after you text either of these, they'll reply back saying you've been signed up to receive the alerts. Um, if you're not comfortable with texting them, you can always email the Gypsy Moth, email at gypsymoth at agr.wa.gov, or you can call our hotline at 1 800 443 6684 and we can sign you up for them. Um, I believe that's the end of my slide, so I'm going to go ahead and turn that back over to Carla um, for the portion of question and answers. Okay, Leah, can you advance the, I think there might be, yeah. Um, I'd like to invite Sven, our um, managing entomologist, just to kind of give a, a quick wrap up here for us before we move to the questions. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Sven Spieschiger. I'm the managing entomologist with the pest program at the Washington State Department of Agriculture. I'll be serving as the incident commander for the proposed spray event and just uh, would like to thank you very much for taking the time to come and receive some information this evening. Uh, as we found out, gypsy moth, of course, is a high risk invasive threat to Washington's environment. And um, as a longtime Pennsylvania resident, I can tell you I am thrilled that uh, WSDA before I arrived has successfully and safely prevented gypsy moth from establishing in the state since 1977. And so that's uh, a very good track record. Uh, we're happy to answer all of your questions uh, that we can and respond to any concerns about the proposed treatment. And as always, if you want more information, please visit our, our website or contact us at gypsymoth at agr.wa.gov or 1-800-443-6684. Thanks, Ben. Um, we are now going to take questions. I've only seen a couple in in the chat box. One I went ahead and answered is it was a ways back, but there was I'm going to mention it just for anybody who's not able to see the chat box box. But that question was um, whether they'd be notified whether the treatments would be by ground or by air. All of our treatments that we are proposing are. Um, proposed to be done by an airplane. So um, they will all be air. Um, okay, another question. Um, there was a question about whether the BTK is clear. Ryan, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah. Uh, so Sherry, the uh, BTK is kind of a tan color. Um, and then what it comes out of what's called a... Uh, in when we spray, it's a uh, rotary atomizer is what they're called. And they, it, it puts it into uh, those make really small drops. So the droplet size, each droplet size is a little bit smaller than the size of uh, the width of a human hair. They're very, very small droplets. So uh, once it gets on the leaves and stuff, I mean, you can barely see this stuff, but if it's in a, a big bulk container, uh, then it's, you can see it as a uh, tan, tan color. So. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. And then she had a follow-up question was, um, if there was one moth trapped in the Silver Lake area, how many gypsy moths are thought to be in the area? I'm not sure who wants to take that one. I can grab that, Carla. Uh, this is Sven Spieschiger. So, uh, it's uh, it's very difficult to know, which is uh, why we take uh, any detection, especially of an Asian gypsy moth, extremely serious. 
Um, as you learned earlier in the evening, the females are capable of flight. And so anytime you get uh, an Asian gypsy moth popped up, uh, you're, you're really looking at an area that's, you know, maybe up to 20 miles away. And uh, we know the males will travel quite a distance to get to one of our traps as well. Uh, what's uh, very uh, befuddling about the Silver Lake detection is that it is, it's not an obvious introduction point. We don't have a major port sitting at the boat ramp in Silver Lake. And so when we get one detection there in Silver Lake, we have to treat it like uh, this is uh, a male that hatched out from an egg mass, even though, uh, you know, you have a, a couple of scenarios. One possibility is that it was just a, a hitchhiking moth that hopped off a ship and somehow ended up there. And so we're only dealing with one. And if that's the case, great. But unfortunately, with what we have at risk, we can't take that chance. We have to treat it like it literally did hatch out of an egg mass in the immediate vicinity. And then you could be dealing with several hundred. And uh, un unfortunately, we've had some scenarios where we, we kind of waited in the past um, just to see what would happen the next season, only to see the population explode. And then it becomes a very costly treatment involving many more acres. And so um, right now uh, we're certain there was one, but there could be more, which is why we're taking it serious and treating. Great, uh, that's the only questions that I've seen pop in. Jessica, please uh, chime in if I've missed a question somewhere. I will mention there was one uh, question about the color of the spray and something that we haven't mentioned that um, has been problematic for people in the past is that, um, so BTK is kind of sticky and um, your car, you will, you will notice it on your car and like on your windshield. And so, um, you know, sign up for those notifications. So you'll know either to, you can park your car in the garage or you can cover it with something um, or bring in like, um, you know, children's play toys from the yard or things like that. Um, it will avoid a little bit of cleaning that you would have to do. Um, it's not hard. It does come off with soap and water, but um, Sometimes people are surprised about that. So we like to let people know that um, that is something to be aware of and, but it's easily averted. It also, um, Leah reminds me, it does have a very distinct kind of smell, um, which it does dissipate. It's not, I don't think it's horrible, but um, it is, it is notable. And I'll just wait another minute or two. I don't see any other questions coming in. But I'll take this one last chance um, while we wait to see if anything comes in. Just to remind people, um, you can always send us questions at gypsymoth at agr.wa.gov or by calling our hotline at 1-800-443-6684. And we always have a lot of information on our website. Again, that's agr.wa.gov slash gypsymoth. So I don't see any more questions. So I'd like to thank you again for your time. Again, please don't hesitate to contact us if you do think of any other questions. And we wish you a really wonderful evening.